So we have point defects where it's happening at a single spot. You've got line one-dimensional defects where it's happening along a line. And you can have two-dimensional defects where it's all across a plane in your material. What are some examples of this? Well, the most common one is a uh, grain boundary, right? We've been talking about this all semester. Grain boundaries are these surfaces where we keep on saying that the bonds don't quite match up right, and so there's this enthalpic penalty by not having the bonds quite right. That is an example of a two-dimensional defect in your material. And we can see it when we look at these things. Take a look at this crystal that somebody's sort of approximated here. You can see that there's regions where they are lined up nicely. We can see that there's this sort of continuous periodicity within this region, right? But if you look close now at the regions between where these things come together, you see that it's all broken up, that you have things really crowded together maybe or really too far apart. In other words, the bonding's not quite matching up right. And so all along all of these surfaces, all the way along these grain boundaries, you have an energy, right? We call this a surface energy. You'll usually see it written in joules per meter squared, right? Um, and that's an example of something that is going to cost your system energy, right? Now, grain boundaries are usually only a few atoms thick, and they can exist in sort of different varieties. You can have a high angle or a low angle grain boundary. What do we mean by that? Well, a high angle grain boundary versus a low angle grain boundary refers to how mismatched the, the, the lattices are as they come together. For example, here, if we line up these ones, these ones are lined up this way. These ones are lined up that way. So we could literally extend these out and we could plot the angle between them. If that's a large angle, it's a high angle grain boundary. If it's a low angle, then it would be a low angle grain boundary, right? So let's look at some examples, right? Here's an example of a low angle grain boundary, right? These things are almost lined up, but technically they're not. And so you get along here the grain boundary. If you zoom in on that, what you'd see is this. It ends up being like that. You've got this, you've got that. And all of a sudden you realize this looks like a bunch of edge dislocations stacked on top of each other. In fact, low angle grain boundaries can be thought of as a series of stacked edge dislocations, right? And because of that, because we know what the Burgers vector is, right, that distance there, if you know this angle, then you can figure out the distance between those, right? It's been, so, it's been shown that D, the distance between those, is equal to B over theta, right? Now the reason why you could do the geometric proof, it's essentially that the sine of theta over 2 should be equal to b over 2d, but when sine of theta is using a small angle, then we approximate sine of theta over 2 as just theta over 2, okay? So these are examples of grain boundaries, and again, you can think of them as a series of stacked edge dislocations all along those grain boundaries, okay? Now what do we know about grain boundaries? They, we know that they have bonds which aren't present, and so that's costing energy. But because you have these regions that are sort of messed up, you end up with large spaces or really squeezed spaces, these tend to be the spots that are more chemically active, right? In other words, if you have impurities in your material, right, you have a lattice where you have this really small atom or really large atoms, instead of going into the host site as a substitutional or interstitial uh, dopant, these might be tempted to segregate to the grain boundaries because that's where there's more open space or more... Uh, is already costing the system energy to have those grain boundaries. So these are going to segregate to the grain boundaries. If you have a grain boundary through your material, these will tend to segregate and stay put along the grain boundaries. Now something we know is that all along these, the surface area costs energy. Therefore, if you can minimize the surface area of these, then you minimize the energy. Therefore, instead of having uh, many, many small grains, which have lots of surface area, there's a driving force to do what's called coarsening. These materials want to coarsen. You want to go from re lots of really small grains to fewer large grains. So as they grain, one as they grow, the grains have to consume the small ones to grow the large ones. And we'll talk more about that in a few chapters when we get to grain growth. Another type of two-dimensional defect in a material is a twin boundary. And a twin boundary is just a special type of grain boundary that preserves mirror symmetry, right? If it preserves mirror symmetry on both sides of the boundary, it's a twin boundary. So let's take a look at that here. Do you see that here? Well, here's the twin boundary. Here's another one. It needs to have mirror symmetry on both sides of it. And sure enough, this atom matches with that one. This one would match with that one. Over on this one, this one matches here. So that would be an example of a twin boundary, right? It's a special type of grain boundary, preserves mirror symmetry.
Another thing we could do is have a stacking fault. If you remember from our tennis ball demo, when we stack them up to either get FCC or HCP, depending on the order that we chose, what if that order got interrupted? For example, FCC is supposed to be ABC, ABC, ABC stacking, where you go from the first site, a second one, and then a different third one, then you start over. Well, what if instead of that, you end up with ABC, ABA instead of C? That means that you've got a stacking fault in your material, right? Because you, you're missing the C, the C level got disappeared there. That will cost some amount of energy as well, these stacking faults, right? And they're also present in materials. Again, looking from the side at that, it would look like this. Here's your regular stacking scenario on this side, and here it got interrupted. The blue series got interrupted there. Another type of two-dimensional uh, defect in your material are phase boundaries. We know that if you bring together atoms that are very different electronegativity, for example, they might, instead of just being randomly distributed through the host atom, they might instead choose to form an, uh, an intermediate compound. And we can see that when those form, like in this case right here, you can end up with a boundary between the host and this new phase. And across that boundary, it's going to have some uh, energy, it's going to have some surface energy, right? So these can see, you can see them this way. Imagine that all the black atoms were slightly smaller in size, so they're going to squeeze. That means that along this, you can see that there's a mismatch in terms of strain. That's one example of the sort of phase boundary that you can get. Um, so these also cost energy. The last type of two-dimensional uh, uh, defect we'll talk about in this class are ferromagnetic domains or ferroelectric domains. So this idea of domains, domains come into effect when you have other properties like dipoles or magnetic moments within your grain. So let's draw an example of what I mean. Within your material, you might have a bunch of grain boundaries, right? So these things are organized in certain directions, but now Within those grains, it's possible to have magnetic moments. For example, let's say the magnetic moments are pointing this way, up and to the right. But then, within your grain, within the same crystallographic orientation, something happens, and the other part of your crystal has those things pointing the other direction. Right? If those magnetic moments are pointing up here and pointing down over here, then even though it's all the same crystallographic orientation, you still have a domain boundary along that interface. Do you see it? So we will talk a lot more about that when we get to uh, dipoles uh, in ferroelectric materials and when we talk a little bit more about magnetic materials. But for now, just realize that it's a different type of surface that can exist and it has a small energy penalty for it. Okay? Now, the last thing before we move on is that you can have uh, defects in, the, in three dimensions. So they're not planes, lines, or points. They are volumes. And these are things that you're probably more familiar with, things like cracks, um, pores, inclusions, big secondary phases. These would be examples of three-dimensional defects in a material.